Hey guys, how are you guys, I hope you you all doing great. So in this video we are gonna see, what if Vimal Arachimaru obsess with Naruto instead of Sasuke, this is part 5. And if you want more then please leave a like, share with your friends. Also subscribe for more amazing video, let's get started. Three heiresses walk through a part, if the village away from the clan district. This by itself would hardly be noteworthy except all three, were headed toward the apartment building of the QB container. That, people paid attention to, but none of the three young ladies returned the attention. Hinata, Hanabi, and Ino were headed towards Naruto's rooftop garden, one he'd been cultivating since he started at the Shinobi Academy. His team got a mission of unspecified length, and several of his plants were at a delicate stage. He then handed her a sealed tag and said it would grant her access to the garden and his apartment, both protected by security seals. Hinata agreed but knew very little about gardening, even with his detailed directions, so she enlisted her teammate. She was somewhat surprised the Yamanaka joined in so readily until she figured it would be a chance to snoop a little and collect some gossip. She may have been getting better, or at least more subtle, but Ino was Ino. She didn't expect the thing that drove the Mindjutsu specialist wild was the presence of high-quality volcanic ash, apparently a luxury prized by every horticulturist worth her salt. Hinata suspected it was from his lava jutsu, but she'd never share that little tidbit, not even after he saw fit to reveal it. It'd be difficult to explain she was observing him for a S-rank trader because of a deal she'd made when she was four. Besides, it was one of her fondest memories, seeing the presumed impossible, and then his reaction, how he lit up so bright he rivaled the very sun. How it was made all the more impressive by how many times he failed to manage it, and besides for moments of doubt, he kept going. It was inspiring, enough to allow her not to falter in her own pursuits. If anyone knew, they'd call her a traitor and likely a coward, but she didn't care. It was her life and she wouldn't live it how others thought she should. But that didn't mean she'd forego all responsibilities. She wanted to make sure her little sister wouldn't be a slave to the outdated clan doctrine of the Hyuga, that she wouldn't devote herself to the Hyuga way simply because it was expected. No, Hanabi wouldn't be arrogant, an elitist like much of her clan, even many of the branch members look down on non Hyuga residents. They claim it is the traditions of the clan that kept it strong, but the clan has flourished under the protection of Kanoha. There was a reason while it was significant clan, it was the Senju and the Uchiha that changed a path of Shinobi. But the Hyuga would never admit it, never tell the truth of their history. Their way was the same as every other clan during the warring era, procreate a lot and hope for the best. Rigid traditions would be exploited and get you killed. If nothing else, she'd be thankful to Orochimaru for providing her alternative histories, alternatives to a lot of things. Even if she were ordered to throw the fight against Niji it didn't matter, she was secure in her strength and her purpose. She'd only have to lend that strength to Hinabi, so she wouldn't be swallowed up in hagiographies and lies or seduced into the cult of the gentle fist. If she were lucky, it'd be the lasting legacy of her rebellion, and like a true shinobi, no one would ever truly know she'd been the architect. The three girls jumped to the roof, with Hinata helping Hinabi, and entered the garden. For a restricted space, the vegetation present was breathtaking, various colors strewn throughout. It was peaceful but gave off a feel of being nearly untamed, bordering on chaotic. It fit with the spiraling maelstrom that created it. The trio got to work, watering, pruning or even harvesting what needed to be. A crop of heirloom tomatoes, deep purple in color and quite plump, were especially ready. I bet Sasuke Kun would really like these, tomatoes are his favorite food. Ino chirped and Hinata responded noncommittally, not wanting to encourage talk of the Achiha. So and here it came, the fishing expedition. There aren't a lot of people that know much about Naruto and I didn't think he was close to any of the rookies outside of Shikamaru and Shino, so would he pick you to tend to his secret garden? As I've said before, Ino, he was low on options and knew I liked flower pressing. He figured I could manage it, I knew better, and that's why I asked you. But he at least rusted you somewhat, you need a seal to even get in here. I suppose he does. How'd you manage it? We talked, Eno. The story is the same, after our joint exercise we had dinner and just talked. Must have been some talk, I've tried talking to Saz K Kun for years, and it's gone nowhere. One night and you're getting keys to the apartment. Maybe I should take lessons. Eno stated with a shit-eating grin. What's so significant about getting keys, Nisama? Ino is suggesting Naruto likes me in a romantic sense. Does he? No, Amato, he doesn't. Ino just has an overactive imagination. 
That's good, besides Niji Niacin hates him. Don't allow Niji's feelings to dictate too much to you, Hanabi-chan. He hates the rain when he gets wet, so him hating someone isn't that remarkable. Hi. In the shimmering leaf, one of Kanoha's nicest hotels, sat Ichiro Kurosawa. A once handsome young man chestnut hair and a slim physique. His face was boyish, his eyes a forest green. He was 5'8", not incredibly tall but not short either. He'd used his looks and his position as leader of Ishval to charm many women over his 30 years of life, but that was in the past. Since that demon came to Ishval. The people called him the Crimson Tiger, but Ichiro knew the boy wasn't a beast, but something worse. He stared into the bathroom mirror, looking at himself cursing how he'd lost it all. His chocolate brown kimono and matching sash, both made of the finest silks of his home. He once prided himself on giving off the impression he was an aristocrat, a noble of one of the major lands. A sophisticated and cunning tactician. Few of his sources of pride remained intact, however, and he couldn't help but curse his fall. At first, he'd been happy his plan to lure Kushimaru and Raiga into attacking the Leaf Ninja had worked. Those two were too busy chasing down the squad, made all the more difficult as the resistance forces were acting in concert with the Kanoha Ninja. All of his enemies were distracted in thinning themselves out, what could be better? Except, the demon apparently took the words of the resistance fighters to heart as they, likely, filled his head with tales of their oppression. How they worked for very little and much of the richest were hoarded by their once leader. As if they could understand the responsibilities of leadership. It required much so it deserved equal reward. They all had enough, no one starved. Why wasn't enough satisfactory? Because they were selfish and spiteful. He wasn't soft-hearted like his father, he wasn't going to just give all of his rightful wealth away. Their selfishness unleashed that thing on him, the boy and one other were smuggled out of Ishval, but they found time to plant a trap in his office. It was only the worn floorboards of his second-story office that saved his life from the inferno that consumed it. But it wasn't unscathed, he suffered burns over three-fourths of his body. The left side of his face was now disfigured, and he needed the help of a cane to walk. That was why it took them so long to arrive in Kanoha, he required the aid of a carriage to transport him and his samurai. A loyal fool that took the codes of Iron Country far too seriously, but he'd be useful. Before he left, Ichiro wanted Yuzumaki Naruto dead. No punishment the old Hokage could levy would deter the man, he'd already lost his position. He remembers the old man intimidating him with such ease, as if all before those aged eyes were mere ants for him to crush or spare at his whim. How he said the payments Kanoha had been receiving for the last year wasn't enough to forgive what he'd done, and how a team of administrators from the Fire Country's daimyo would be here soon to help with the transfer of power. He'd be one of many voices in the land he was meant to rule. It was insulting. No, it was beyond that. It was profane. Ichiro hated the Hokage, he hated the missing Nin, but more than anything, he hated the Uzumaki. If he'd only died Ichiro wouldn't have lost everything but his revenge. Saratobi Asuma sat in a training field trying to get lightning to arc in his hand. It had been about a month since he got a note delivered from a short-tempered panther that wasn't inclined to give his name. That he delivered said note in the middle of the night, in Asuma's bedroom with nothing having been disturbed, meant the former guardian ninja didn't sleep well. The note, from Naruto, stated if he wanted to learn the supersonic chakra flow he'd have to, at the very least, compete the first nature transformation exercise for lightning. Progress had been minimal. When one is used to using their chakra in specific ways, using them in different ways is akin to trying to write with your non-dominant hand, except you have that feeling of wrongness throughout your entire body. Azuma had just managed to give himself several chakra burns. Ah, damn it. He near shouted, but the beautiful Jinjutsu mistress only giggled in response. She'd been back for two weeks, as her boys were sent on an additional mission to the land of tea. She'd seen Asuma's struggle and could sympathize. Getting used to using elemental jutsu was incredibly difficult for her, but she pushed through and gotten both of her elements, earth and fire, back under control. It made both Jown and respect the Sandame for managing to learn and master every element. They were simply left in awe of Naruto, having beat the Sandame's record by a decade. If I didn't know any better I'd see the kid was trolling me. Just complete the first exercise of the competing chakra nature, that's the easy part he wrote. From how he explained it to me, the next step really is some order of magnitude more difficult. He speculated it might be the effects of yin chakra, that we can limit ourselves by our beliefs, and those beliefs get engraved in our bodies. If, on some level, 
You don't think this is possible then it won't be. Ugh, he sounds like how dad was when I was a kid. It's not easy accepting your father is both the god of shinobi who could kick your ass on his worst day and also a geek. Speaking as someone that is heavily involved in the mental arts, I'll try not to take offense. Kurenai huffed, playfully. Ah, you know I wasn't talking about you. Jinjutsu is cool, hell I'm sure the brat can do some interesting things. It's hearing the thought process behind it that's geeky. Didn't he write something on the battle implications of the Shenshin? Kurenai laughed, yes, he did. We all thought he was being a little, much when he gave us a copy. See, just like dad. Azuma said and then frowned as he tried, once again, to generate lightning. How are you and your father? Outside of work we haven't spoken. I just can't deal with him. It was Kurnai's turn to frown as she sat up and looked Azuma in the eyes. I won't try to justify what he did, but it was decades ago, and given what's on the horizon, you may not have much time to resolve your issues. Azuma bit down on his unlit cigarette, a silent concession to her argument. I can't disagree with that. I also can't deal with him. He used to tell all of us about how we had to sacrifice time with him for the village, how it pained him to be away from us. My mom always defended him, to the point she sometimes strained her relationship with us. And for what? So he can do the most cliched thing a person in his position could do? So much of my life has revolved around choices Hiraz and Zeratobi made, I just had to deal with it. I came to terms with some of it, ignoring he didn't have to stay Hokage, as long as he did. But this? To betray my mom, when she was his champion, when she was likely missing him just as much as we were. And look at the results? Also he could feel like a big man? Then say that. I'm not saying forgive him, only don't leave things unsaid. I don't want you to regret it, and have to carry it. If nothing else, at least you can avoid that. I can't make any promises. But let's change the topic, when are your brats due back? Sometime today. Kurenai said, sullenly. What's wrong? Sandame Sama is going to finally inform Naruto of his responsibilities as a Jinchuriki during wartime. Shit. Yay. Also, the leader of Ishval, that mission that went so wrong for Naruto, while he was a reservist is still in the village, and I'm afraid Naruto may cut him down on sight. That would not be good for his profile. It wouldn't. Hopefully, after he meets with Sandame Sama, he'll just return to Arachimaru's and avoid any trouble. Kurnai said, having zero faith in her luck. Naruto-san, you've been really quiet. Shino observed as the trio ate breakfast, before starting their final push into Kanoha. It wouldn't take long to arrive to the village as they'd kept an impressive pace, before stopping the night before. As they ate, the Aburam and Nara noticed their teammates seemed lost in thought. It wasn't unusual, but the periods of silence often resulted in something novel, so Shino was curious, what could be formulating in the Redeed's mind. Oh, sorry, he said, scratching the back of his head, I was just thinking, when that Aoi bastard activated the rage in no ken, if he'd been in a dust cloud of coal he'd have blown himself up. I was wondering, if I could create a jutsu to do so. Just think, a trap jutsu against Raiden users from the element that is weakest against it. The other two boys perked up at the thought. If he had, we'd have lost a treasure of the village, Shikamaru started, pointing to the lightning sword clipped to Naruto's waist, and then followed up with, what would be the complications? Shikamaru asked. Very few doten are performed by strictly internal manipulation. The chakra is generally directed toward the ground. But a dust cloud would be released from the mouth, I'd imagine. To try to do it from the ground would just seem too uncontrollable. Naruto started, another issue is getting the correct rock type and then into dust. Sounds troublesome. Potentially, I won't know until I start the process. Sometimes the manipulation is easier than you think it'll be. If it works, I likely won't keep it a clan technique, given our status with Kumo and the abundance of Doten users. That would certainly endear you to many of the forces. Shino observed. For some reason, I doubt it. Naruto replied then started breaking down camp. His squadmates only frowned slightly in acknowledgement of his words, not liking that their upbeat teammate didn't have much faith in his comrades. Three medics and a mad scientist sit around Arachimaru's rectangular kitchen table. After Naruto's query about the poison Miss Jutsu Arachimaru thought it wise to enlist the help of Tsunade and Shizune. They'd likely take a different approach than either she or Kabuto would. It didn't take long for Tsunade to conclude the original Jutsu was a necrotoxin, meant to cause rapid and expansive cellular death. The challenge was to adapt that to other types. 
It seemed all were energized by this new puzzle. Arachimaru had managed to create a myotoxin, one mimicking some of her summons. She could even control if it simply paralyzed or was eventually fatal. Soon Eight and Shizun were able to create a neurotoxin variant. The meeting was to decide where else to take their project and who they'd teach, if any, these new techniques. While all the women were enthused with their progress, Kabuto quietly fumed that the inspiration for this was Naruto, someone he was convinced was in need of promote removal. He hated how his mistress wouldn't even consider using live subjects to test her new jutsu. She claimed it was not worth the risk as they were still being watched, but he suspected it was because her newest student wouldn't approve. As if his opinion mattered in the slightest. Kudyuto kun, would you like to join us? Sorry, Arachimaru sama. The former spy said, adjusting his glasses as he did, which did not go unnoticed. As I was saying, these aren't like elemental ninjutsu. Having a high degree of scientific knowledge is necessary to properly form the jutsu. That really only leaves Iryonin to learn them. Anko would have sufficient knowledge, she deals with poisons, and I trained her well in the sciences. Anko-san may be ideal. Unfortunately, from what Tsunade Sama and I have witnessed, we have a lot of medics, but virtually no combat medics in the regular forces. I'd hesitate teaching a non-combatant these, and I can't estimate how long it'd take them to get back up to par. Shizun stated before taking a sip of teach from a floral patterned cup. Agreed. Tsunade said, annoyed. We've got a new crop, from Chunin to Jenin, but they are still learning the basics, so B rank jutsu that could harm them if not performed correctly, I just can't see it. What about you? She asked the snake Sanin. Mine roughly mimicked the venom of my summon so having a close bond with the snakes would make it easier. I'll pass on a scroll to Anko as I doubt she'd welcome my presence. But as for your versions, Karen would be able to manage it. She's no Jenin, I assure you of that. I'll consider it, it'd be nice to share something with my cousin clan. So, what's next? Shape manipulation. Arachimaru said and then laughed, when all three medics hung their heads. It's a truism, but medics are complete and total crap at advanced shape manipulation. I'll get Naruto-kun to contribute, if neither of you mind. Great, he'll have a six-headed poison bird flying around in no time. Kabuto muttered absent-mindedly. Causing Arachimaru to put eyes on him, Tsunade quirked her brow, and Shizun frowned in response. Sounds like someone is jealous of your new student. What's wrong, brat, sensei not giving you enough personal attention? Tsunade teased. Kabuto would normally glare at someone that mocked him, but he liked having his head attached to his body, so he decided to play along. I'll admit, it is difficult not to feel inadequate around Naruto-kun. To be so gifted at such an age. Kukuku, fret not, Kabuto kun Your talents may lie elsewhere, but they are considerable. The foursome finished their meeting, and the slug Sanin departed with her student. While she had placated him then, Arachimaru had no intention of doing so, now that they were alone. We clearly need to talk, Kabuto kun About what, Arachimaru-sama? The question earned him the kusanagi to his throat. Have you grown so arrogant as to think you can play dumb with me, boy? The white snake asked, pressing the blade just hard enough it wouldn't draw blood. Kabuto did a small shake of his head and she withdrew her sword. Now, what is your problem? The medic knew he couldn't say what he really wanted to, that the red-haired Yuzumaki was dulling her blade. That he was a bad influence on her, changing her in small but noticeable ways and he hated it. That he missed twisting lower life forms as they laid, helpless, on a cold steel table. Then an idea struck him. I feel restless, Arachimaru-sama. When I was a double agent there was at least the risk of that, as well as being able to do our work. But now, I'm a genin. The Sandame isn't going to promote me in retaliation for being a spy, the only thing that saves me is your pardon. I need something to do, I'm going stir-crazy. I'm sorry. Kukuku, I can relate. I detest when things stagnate. I'll see if I can arrange a mission for you, something nice and bloody. How's that sound? Like just what I need, Arachimaru-sama. I'll set it up, but don't you have a shift at the hospital? Yes, I do. I'll leave now. Kabuto stated and vacated the manor. Arachimaru wasted no time summon a snake, a puff adder that was brown with specks of black. Arachimaru looked down the small snake and relayed her orders, go to Gurin Chan, tell her I believe Kabuto may be planning to betray me. Tell her to make the necessary preparations and wait for confirmation. The snake dispelled itself and she continued to sit at her table, now deep in thought. 
Kabuto would be recognized as her second in command by most, but truthfully, she's never trusted the spy. He worked for someone attempting to kill her, and his greatest skill is his duplicity. But he believed he was her most trusted, most relied on subordinate. Kabuto likely believes he knows more about her plans and her network than anyone else. He knows a tiny fraction and she had kept track of how much he knew so, if he ever turned on her, all of his information could be rendered moot as she burned those segments. Only Kamimro and Gurin had her full faith as far as subordinates went, and both had the good sense to never be jealous of Naruto. He was different and meant for more. Kabuto had seemingly forgotten this or just disliked it enough to consider rebelling. It was a shame, he was a talented medic and researcher. He hadn't maximized his potential, but if he were committed to betraying her, then Kabuto would meet a slow and painful end. His ability to self-heal would only prolong his suffering. Her only true concern was that Kabuto wouldn't target herself but Naruto. She'd simply watch and wait as this might just be adolescent petulance. A samurai, trained in Iron Country by the famed Ito Iron Wolf Watanabe, sat just inside the check-in gate of Konoha. He'd do this periodically, waiting for his target, and it seemed his steadfastness and patience had finally paid off. Three pre-teens were at the gate, and he could finally complete the task given to him by his new lord. One of the boys had horrible posture for an alleged warrior and looked incredibly lazy. Another, covered up in a large jacket with his eyes guarded by darkened glasses, just seemed to want to fade into the background. But it was the last one, the short one in a flak jacket similar to the lazy boy, except he had a sword strapped to his back. Red hair down to his shoulders and three whisker marks on each cheek. This was the alleged fearsome warrior that had caused such damage? It was somewhat hard to believe, but as a trained samurai he knew ninja could do some truly incredible things. Nothing a true samurai had to worry about, like many of the inidians of Iron Country, he believed Shinobi could not stand up to them in direct combat, but only win through disreputable and honorless methods. That's why he planned to challenge the boy directly. A part of him distressed at killing one so young, the boy had chosen his path and must walk it to its very end. He put his hand on the hilt of his sword, preparing to walk toward the so-called tiger, but the boy disappeared in a blur, leaving only his teammates to come through the gate. He approached the two boys, his back straight, his gait smooth but purposeful. He would always display his pride as a swordsman, a warrior, and would use it to intimidate the two youngsters. Excuse me, may I have a word? He asked, his face emotionless. Regarding what? The covered up boy asked. That boy that just departed, was he Yuzumaki Naruto? Without missing a beat, the lazy boy asked, troublesome, why do you want to know? We have a private matter to settle and it cannot be delayed. He said, grip tightening on his sword. The boys made a face, he assumed they would debate whether or not to tell him. Kanoha Shinobi don't give information about their comrades to strangers. If you want to meet Yuzumaki Naruto you should go to the Hokage, so he can set it up. The lazy boy said. I may not be able to get a meeting with your leader and this is time sensitive. If that was Naruto-san, you do well to tell me now, so I can be on my way. Forgive me, but that sounded like a threat. Are you threatening us, Samurai-san? The other boy, he'd almost forgot was there, asked. Now, he was receiving the attention of others and realized it was in his interest not to press things further. If you know Naruto-san, please have him meet me at the Shimmering Leaf, it would be appreciated. And the swordsman walked away. He never did give us a name. Shino observed. Troublesome, we better report this. Shikamaru said before a weasel masked Anbu appeared before them. It is already known, Nara-san. You may go about your day. He said dryly and shunshin it away. Troublesome. Shino, that's my line. Naruto entered the Hokage's office with an impassive face, the one he always adopted when dealing with the old man. He was surprised to see his advisors and Tsunade in attendance. It, he reasoned, explained why he was requested to report directly to the Hokage alone. He stepped forward and greeted the Hokage formally. The man didn't visibly react, but it still hurt that his bond with Naruto was gone. However they had more important matters, and it'd be another indictment on his foolishness. Thank you for getting here so promptly, Naruto-kun. As you can surmise, I didn't call you here for a debriefing on a standard C rank. Instead, I am here to inform you of some important information. Naruto kept his impassive facade, but internally wondered what could be so important to him specifically. The Hokage, after taking a moment, continued, as you know, soon we will be in a state of war, officially. 
When that happens, you as a Jinshuriki will no longer be in the traditional chain of command. All hidden villages do this, we just don't let it be known who our Jinshuriki are. In fact, until it is declared the war has ended you'd be under the direct command of the sitting Hokage. Your status, Naruto, would be equal to the Jounin and Anbu commanders, Hamura added. During the Third Shinobi War, your mother was not on the battlefield for long, instead she was in charge of domestic security. Her Junjutsu knowledge and talent with barriers made her ideal for keeping Kanoha safe from any parties trying to attack us directly. Most of the shinobi forces that knew her were too afraid to contradict her and unquestioned her status when Hiruzen gave the order. Kaharu stated. We haven't decided what your overall status would be but I am leaning towards Chunin commander. You should start studying strategy and tactics in case. You should also keep in mind, there will be pushback, but you have to find a way to navigate it. Hiruzen finished and the Uzumaki lost his face, feeling overwhelmed but more so angry. If only I'd been a Chunin for longer than five minutes. How do you expect the largest section of the shinobi forces to listen to a 12-year-old that just got promoted? Naruto asked, seethingly. I know this isn't ideal Naruto-kun, but it is what must be done. We'll be firming up our plans for the invasion and relaying it all to you soon. Now, if there isn't anything pressing you need to share you are dismissed. Naruto unhooked something from his back and turned toward Tsunade, who'd been quiet this entire time, as her voice was already hoarse with rage. I retrieved the rage in no ken, here you go Oba-chan, Naruto said, throwing the hill to the slug Sanin and departing before any questions could be asked. He also missed the fond smiled Tsunade, Kaharu, and Hamura had of the lost Zenju treasure and reminder of their family and sensei respectively. It was short-lived. He's not ready for this. Tsunade said, raspily. He has no choice but to be. People are guaranteed to die, you're going to put the responsibility on him with no previous command experience? Once again, this is what is needed, Tsunade. Whatever scheme we go with, Kur and I won't be there. I can't run the risk of someone intentionally putting him in harm's way. And this will show the others that he isn't some monster, but truly one of them. Conversely, Naruto will see he isn't as detested as he thinks he is. I know it's my fault I've allowed that impression to continue, but he'll see. Some are hesitant because he is so capable with minimal training from us and Arachimaru's interest, but I believe he'll sit in this chair one day. The path starts now. Your machinations of late have left a lot to be desired, but on this, I agree. Naruto thinks only a handful of people see him for who he is, some more simply tolerate him. That belief can't continue. He needs to see that his comrades are not bigots or potential enemies. That he can depend on them and they will acknowledge his value. There aren't many ways to do that, this invasion offers an opportunity. Kahara supplied, surprising all in attendance. Then why not start preparing him sooner? Tsunade asked. He needed to increase his combat effectiveness to that of a respectable Jounin. From the reports I've seen, he's reached that level, and that's without the QB chakra. So, what, you think he's an S-class ninja? Tsunade asked sarcastically. No, don't be foolish. But I do believe, with adequate information and time to plan he can kill one. The Iron Country trained samurai cursed missing his target. He returned to his lord, only to be admonished for not considering the boy was going to report to the Hokage. It made sense so he left the hotel immediately, his destination the Hokage Tower. He never made it, having seen the Uzumaki out and about. Deciding to do a little research, as the residents had been incredibly tight-lipped about anything retarding the boy. The samurai assumed it was because he wasn't a resident, and as such they didn't trust him. He stalked the Uzumaki, watching the boy purchase various fruits from a stand. The interaction was stilted between the operator and the ninja, both appearing to tolerate each other and no more. He then watched as the boy entered a convenience store and exited with bottles of water, storing them in a scroll, along with the fruit before darting off. It was difficult to keep up without alerting the younger male, but the samurai managed it. He followed the Uzumaki onto a field, a likely training area that was inhabited by a copy of the Redeed and three children. The children, two boys and a girl, were shins deep in a small pond going through hand-to-hand -hand forms, while the copy of the Uzumaki looked on. The one he'd followed handed the other the scroll and then disappeared in a puff of smoke. The samurai hide behind a tree and watched the kids train and complain about the exercise. Boss, why do we have to do this? Konohamaru asked. It'll increase your speed and has none of the drawbacks of weights or resistance seals. This is how I trained when I was your age, and I certainly didn't have anyone around to make me a freaking pond, you ingrates. 
That was cool, but my sandals are wet and it feels weird. Mogi chimed it. No one told you to wear your sandals. Naruto shot back. But I didn't want muddy feet. I made the bottom stone. That was meet with a round of O's from the academy students. Soon the children switched to weapons training before the Uzumaki called the training session to a close and gave them the fruit and water. The summer I watched as the, alleged, demon chatted and joked with the kids before sending them on their way. The Uzumaki then whistled a tune before speaking, you can come out now. That shocked the samurai, he thought he'd gone undetected, but it was clear he was wrong. He walked purposefully, his navy blue kozoed and matching hakama swaying in the wind. His katana strapped to his side, held in place by a white obi. The sword itself, very basic with a black cord wrapping, a standard tsuba and a black scabbard. He stopped just three meters shy of his target. Perfect distance for a speedy blade draw. One cut, one kill and did it all be over. I am here on behalf of my lord, Kurosawa Ichiro Sama, he started and saw a flash of rage appear in the boy's eyes, the blue seeming colder now. He's alive? And he sent you here all the way from Ishbal, told you to infiltrate a shinobi village with the goal of assassinating one of its ninja? He asked in disbelief. No, I accompanied my lord here, I infiltrated nothing. Where is he? The samurai was taken aback by the clipped demanding tone. At the shimmering leaf, room 334. Not that it matters, I was ordered to cut you down and I will. Prepare yourself. Before he could even get in his stance, the samurai was violently toppled, being shoved into the ground and having a wave of chakra flood his system. He could turn his head to see a masked individual holding the Uzumaki back, single-handedly. The Uzumaki, having had his blade drawn and in a perfect position to stab him in the neck, had he not been saved. The Uzumaki was pushed back and made no attempt to attack again. The masked man buried his knee into the samurai, causing the man to grunt in discomfort. What you did is not only illegal but very foolish, samurai-san. Please don't think I said you as where you're going will be much worse than the swift death you were about to receive. How? He placed you under an illusion before you ever said a word to him. When I whistled. Courtesy of a fellow clansperson. Though it wouldn't have fooled a shinobi, Naruto-kun. It needs more work. Everybody's a critic. Well, what do we do now? You dispel and let the original know Ichiro-san is being guarded, so you won't be able to reach him. We'll see. The shadow clone said, before dissolving into a cloud of smoke. I wasn't even facing the real one. The Anbu agent didn't respond, only tying up the swordsman and preparing him for transport to T and I. The real Naruto received the information, but it almost didn't register, as he was awash in painful feelings and memories. Kaio taking the brunt of the explosion on the bridge, being dead before he hit the water. Riku, buried to her neck, her face a vision of pain and sorrow as Raiga gloated over her corpse. Her death hurting all the more because it was Naruto's suggestion they split up for the day. Yugami barely having enough strength to drag them onto this small ship, often delirious before he made it to Tsunade and Shizune. The last he remembered of the man was a brief smile and a thanks, he slipped away while Naruto was blackouted. There was virtually no one Naruto hated. He'd been able to come to terms with his ostracization thanks to Bagheera, and while he disliked the villagers, he didn't hate them and left himself open to change if they did. He hated the old man, but that stemmed from his great sense of disappointment, betrayal, and the still nagging desire to be truly acknowledged by the one he once considered family. But Kurosawa Ichiro was a monster. He had enough and wanted more because having more than all those around him made him feel superior. He was a beast in fancy clothes. A cruel, vain, stupid fuck-up that got dozens of people killed. Naruto knew it was a high percentage of luck that allowed him to survive Ishval, and it had taken him months to deal with the guilt of being the only one to return. One source of solace having been the, assumed, death of the bastard that started it all but he wasn't dead. And for all Naruto knew, he went on to become even worse. That thought made him push himself even harder as he ran across the rooftops in blinding speed. He didn't stop until he was a few buildings away from the hotel. It'd do him no good to just charge in, especially if the man was guarded. He stopped, taking calming breaths, his emotions were all over the place, and that'd leave him open to a mistake. He'd beaten or held off superior opponents because they were sloppy and overconfident. He could never let that be him. He looked around and couldn't pin where the protection detail may be, at least on the exterior of the building. A use of shadow clones and henges could possibly get him close, but if only if he got an undetected. 
Tiring of the internal debate, Naruto selected his plan and was about to make his way to the hotel lobby until he felt the disturbance of an incoming shunshin and then a hand on his shoulder. The person that stopped him had a bandana Hitai 8, a jounin vest and a senbin in his mouth. Gemma Shiranui, one of the members of his father's protection detail. One trusted enough to learn a modified version of the Horation. Naruto met the special Jounin's eyes, awaiting for him to speak first. Gemma, however, was slightly taken aback. He'd seen those eyes before. After Abito, after Rin. The look of determination and the promise of a reckoning. Gemma hoped the kid didn't have his mother's temper and could be reasoned with. Kid, I know why you're here and I understand, but I can't allow you to do this. Just turn around and go about your day. Why is he even here? He got three of our ninja killed, he should be in a cell, not a suite. That is above my pay grade, I just know Sandame Sama ordered me to protect him until instructed otherwise. A fucking course. Naruto said, clenching his fist. That old man was running one of his games again instead of just nibbing the problem in the bud. Give the Sandame a break, trust me, there is more going on than we know, but that guy has not been living in luxury laughing at our losses. Naruto didn't respond. Questionable leadership accounted for, the old man does care about most of his forces, Naruto couldn't deny that fact with a straight face. We okay here? Another Jounin asked from behind. We're fine, Raido. Right, Naruto? Yay, we're fantastic. Good, good. Raido said in response. What about the Pakage? Asked Jenna. In his room, acting antsy. What Raido didn't know was that Ichiro was overflowing with participation, and when he heard his security detail start shifting, he figured the first part of his plan had commenced. He only needed to get ready so he could confront the monster that ruined his life. He was finishing getting dressed, having managed to put a heavy vest over his kimono. It caused him great pain, but it'd be worth it. Ichiro left his room, his guards too focused on the outside threat to pay attention to him. His steps were slow, he foregoing his cane for his showdown. He wouldn't demonstrate one ounce of weakness. He'd restore his pride and have his revenge. The thoughts of his victory dulled the pain he was feeling. Moments later he made it to the door at the lobby and took a deep breath before grasping a remote trigger connected to his vest, pressing down on a red button. Yuzumaki. He yelled. I know you're here Yuzumaki. Come eat me, coward. He was immediately surrounded by an Anbu team. This vest has enough explosives to level several buildings. If you touch me I'll release the trigger. Where is Yuzumaki? Naruto, Genma and Raido shunshin it in front of the man, about three and a half meters back. Ichiro cackled in glee when he saw the red-haired boy standing before him. All foot traffic in the vicinity of the man's shriek stopped, seeing a heavily disfigured person shouting for that boy. I see that idiot samurai got you here. Did you kill him, demon? Ichiro watched as Naruto refused to respond. Answer your betters boy. Did you kill him like you tried to kill me? Like a coward? Answer me or I'll let go of this trigger, I'm not playing. I'm sorry, did you say something? Naruto said and all attending shinobi sweat dropped. Am I some kind of joke to you, you little monster? Am I? Am I? Look at what you did to me. You disfigured and crippled me and all for that trash that didn't know its place. You're alive, you should have been thankful for that. Thankful? Your Hokage has taken everything from me, everything my family built and it's all your fault. You should have died like the rest of those Vater Ninja like I planned. Everyone felt a brief flash of killing intent, it disappearing as fast as it emerged. Those ninja had more guts, character and worth than if you'd managed to live 100 lifetimes. You're wrong. All of you are only good for following the orders of your betters. That stupid samurai was the same. Just obedient dogs for your masters. If not for uppity ninja I'd still be whole. This is all your fault. All involved were starting to tire of the man and his rantings. The problem was, while the Anbu knew containment jutsu, they weren't designed to contain explosions, certainly not ones powerful enough to level several buildings. Attempts to severe the hand might cause the pressure to lighten off the button, and Jinjutsu may be negated, given the signs of agony that were seen in his body language. It's pretty clear he wants to kill Naruto, and there is no way they could allow that to happen. Not only because of his Jinchuriki status, but due to the interests of each of the Sanin and the Sandain, each of the Anbu in attendance shuddered to think what would happen if the Uzumaki died to a civilian nutjob. Naruto, too, was aware things were escalating rapidly and something needed to be done. He was fortunate that he'd been preparing for a mad bomber and had developed a few jutsu to deal with explosions. 
He performed five hand seals, Dragonshabunga horses they can dot water style. Great gummy sphere. The sphere of multi-textured liquid rapidly approached Ichiro and engulfed him before he could move, the Anbu had managed to get out of the way. He was shocked to be suspended in a gel-like prison, and while he could move somewhat he couldn't exit out of the construct. He stared at the Uzumaki, shocked and irate. He couldn't believe his guaranteed victory was slipping away from him. He took a look at his cage, it had roughly a 6 meter diameter. He was confident it couldn't quell the explosion, and he'd likely take some of the villagers with him, even if the Uzumaki got away he'd be blamed for it. Without a second thought he released the button and died at the epicenter of the blast. If he could have somehow seen his attempt he'd have shrieked in displeasure as the gel did contain the blast and the lack of sufficient oxygen for a fire to ignite. The Anbu had taken precautions and created mud walls when they witnessed the man release the trigger, and while they budged, they were not breached. More squads of Anbu showed up with the Sandame and Tsunade in tow. As the Black Ops got the villagers under control, the Sandame decided to question the special Jounin on the scene. Gemma, Rido, what happened? A five-foot loon with a deep wish, sir. Gemma snarked, but saw it was not received well by the aged Hokage. Ichiro-sen had an alleged massive bomb with a remote trigger, a deadman switch at that, and he threatened to use it here. Why? Chunin Yuzumaki arrived, and our shifting to confront him must have alerted Ichiro. He then made his way out here and, boom. Why was Naruto-kun even here? How did he know to come here? The samurai following Ichiro-san. Apparently, he was given orders to attack Yuzumaki-san. His attack was thwarted by an agent on the scene, but the Naruto he stopped was a shadow clone. He alerted us that Yuzumaki-san was headed straight here, Hokage-sama. Replied Kat. And you two stopped him from infiltrating the hotel, leaving your charge unprotected? We didn't think we had to protect him from himself, Hokage-sama. That was beyond our mandate. Raido said in Genma and his mutual defense. The Hokage reluctantly accepted the explanation. So, you stopped Naruto-kun from getting to him. I'm assuming he didn't fight you. No Hokage-sama. Bao Special Jounin replied. But Ichiro-san emerges from the hotel, an explosive strapped to him. What did he want? Pay back on the kid for the impromptu makeover. Guess he didn't feel as pretty as he once did. Gem equipped. And how was it resolved? Clearly he triggered the explosive, but what contained it? Four mud walls would not a massive bomb. The kid had some water jutsu, well it looked like a water jutsu, but I'd never seen it before. Suspended Ichiro in it, and the man assumed it wouldn't be enough to prevent extensive damage. He was wrong. The Sandane took the information in stride, cataloging all useful tidbits. Truthfully, Ichiro wasn't going to make it back to Ishbal anyway. The delay was to cement the transfer of power before he ran into some bad luck on his way back. As such, there was no major loss as far as that goes. No property damage either. I'll have to count this as a failure in your mission's records, I hope you realize that. The Jounin shrugged, neither minded and Hiruzen couldn't blame them. Where is Naruto-kun? I I don't know. Raido answered and Gemma shrugged again. Don't worry about it, I'll send someone to find him. You're both dismissed. Hiruzen said and both Jounin departed without a moment's pause. Hiruzen looked to see his Anbu calming the people down. He even saw Tsune talking to some of the villagers, something that surprised him. She wasn't all that sociable to most people. He saw her finish up her conversation and return to him. She met her sensei's eyes and picked up on the unasked question. I was just curious what they were saying about the incident. Oh, and what did they say? That's a mentally disturbed person essentially tried to hold them all hostage, but was stopped by Naruto. Some even wondered if that's how they sounded, paranoid and cowardly, for being so scared of a 12-year-old. That's good. That's a biased sample. No one who thought poorly of Naruto was going to say it to me unless they wanted to swallow their teeth. Good point, Tsune-chan. Let's return to my office, paywork awaits. Oh joy. She said sarcastically but followed nonetheless. As the day turned into the night, the uproar of near bombing had turned into quiet rumor mongering. Those brave souls in attendance with the power of hindsight and liquid courage spoke about their harrowing encounter. Naruto Uzumaki was on the lips of many, but the heir of the Uzumaki clan was none the wiser as he sat in his retreat, Majila sleeping peacefully in his lap. He was left with his thoughts and her soft snores as he stroked her back gently. A presence made itself known as she entered his rooftop garden, but she remained quiet taking a seat next to Naruto. 
She looked around at his collection of plants, impressed at the diversity and the overall health. It was calming, peaceful in a way not much in their world, was and she understood why he'd come here to be alone. The silence was comfortable, the two at ease with each other, as if they'd known each other for years. As serene as the silence was, she came here for a point and initiated speaking. I heard you had something of a rough day. You could say that. Want to talk about it? I don't even know where to begin. Oh, I fall outside of the normal command structure during wartime, so that's awesome. I may be made Chunin commander as if that's not laughable. Why would that be laughable? I've just been promoted, sensei. Also, I'm that kid. No one is going to want to listen to me and will think I've gotten the position through favoritism or something. Oh, and this little conflict I'd be leading people into only exists because a collection of overpowered psychos want to write the QB from my gut, and it is guaranteed some if not many of us will die. And if that wasn't enough, that gutless tyrant had been alive this entire time and could have done God knows what in retaliation for me trying to kill him. You got that all out of your system? Kunai asked. I'm not throwing a temper tantrum, it's all true. No, you perceive it as true. Sometimes I forget you're still 12. Only for a few more months. Naruto muttered, but Kurunai ignored him. I'll concede, you being put in a leadership position given all that has happened isn't ideal, and it is something the Sandane should have considered while holding you back. No one wants war, but there have been tensions between the five great villages since the end of the last war. But this is partially for your protection. He can't have you assigned to a foolish risk. It isn't pleasant to think about, but your value is greater than almost any other single shinobi, because you protect us all. As far as the prejudice of the shinobi core, it isn't as widespread as you think it is, at least not anymore. There was a time many of us were cautious or afraid. Some have experienced the power of a jinchuriki, many have felt the power of the QB, so leaving the control and containment to a child was not easy to accept but eventually the fear passed and Shane was left. You hadn't done anything but many avoided you anyway, even knowing you provide a vital service, and some continued to avoid you out of that shame. Those who didn't could see you were a very sweet boy that was dealt a bad hand. You may never get a collective apology for how we treated or allowed you to be treated, but many have long come to see you as your own person and our comrade. The Akatsuki goals are of their own choosing, and they are a threat, to say you're somehow responsible is stupid, and you know better so I won't waste any more time on it. And as for this Ichiro person, I know you hate him. Even with him dead you still likely hate him, but you need to let it go. I can't. Why not? Because he made the lives of his people worst for no other reason than it benefited him. He had the power to change things and he didn't, he just watched them suffer and did nothing. People like that, I hate. Must have felt good to strike out at him in Ishval, huh? I guess. And today, you foiled his plans and watched as his scheme was his undoing. That was nice, right? Not really. Naruto said, shaking his head. Oh. Why do you think that is? Because revenge is empty and doesn't change anything. Maybe. I've seen people lose themselves to revenge, and I've seen others get it, and it helped resolve their issues. If it isn't an obsession a little revenge is fine, I think but you didn't get revenge. So then why did it feel empty? Naruto asked, looking at the red-eyed woman. I think you could slay every person like this Ichiro person in the elemental nations, and it wouldn't matter. Why? Because the person you're really angry at, the one you really want to hurt is the Sandame. You see his worst qualities in people like Ichiro. Those who use their power solely for their benefit and watch their subordinates suffer. Like he did with you. I think there is a part of you so angry at him that if you hadn't suppressed it, you'd be blinded with rage and hurt. But people like him, when out of missions, you can stop them. You aren't powerless nor are you subjected to their rule. I already know I hate the old man. Yes, but you always sound divorced from it. You know the emotion is there, but you've walled it off. That's not good Naruto. It means you can never really get past everything, you'll only think you have until something taps into that latent hatred. Naruto chuckles. Arachimaru Shishu asked me if I could forgive him the night before we left. What did you say? That I didn't know if things had been different than maybe. I guess I was lying. No, it just means you're as complex as everyone else. I'll tell you like I told Asuma, you don't need to forgive the Sandane to resolve things with him, but as long as you carry around that hatred and that hurt it'll be an invisible weight on you. I'm not sure I know how to resolve things with him. I've gotten all I need from him. Really? Kurnai asked, voice laced with skepticism. 
Because I believe, if you think really really hard there is one question at the center of this, one answer you need you don't have. The Jinjutsu mistress finished and then departed, after ruffling Rudo's hair. The Uzumaki would spend the rest of the night in his garden, thinking about his sensei's words and so much else. Rasa looked at his children, they were set to leave for Kanoha today. The invasion of Aim would begin a week after there and the other Suna forces arrival. He watched them with a mixture of pride, worry and regret. All three had matured after the Chunin exams, and he'd seen fit to promote each. Tamari worked on her over-reliance on her war fan, Kankuro got better at operating multiple puppets. Gara had demonstrated the largest change. No longer was he lost to his own madness, an infliction borne by Rasa's choices, the Kazikage lamented. He trained harder, working on his endurance in Chijutsu. His Zen techniques improved, and he had even started making amends to the villagers. It was not easy to send them to a warzen. He was their leader and truly hadn't treated them as his children, but he had a father's worry all the same. His children needed to be strong, Suna needed to be strong. Everyone needed him to be stronger still. Strong enough to be near heartless to his children, sacrifice his wife and keep Suna afloat with no support from the daimyo. He'd done it for so long, the cold veneer eventually just became what he was. No one liked him, and it was arguable no one truly respected Rasa the man. They endured Rasa the Kazikage because they had no choice, because no one could lead Suna as he had. He wanted to bridge that gap. He wanted to be a family again, to embrace his children as a father should. They managed to grow closer to each other, and he hoped they had space for him. But he may never see them again, there was no guarantee they'd return, or that the invasion would be successful. So, why could he only give commands and tell them to do Suna proud? Why couldn't he tell them he was proud and loved them dearly? That he was a cold man because he believed it to be the only way to accomplish anything, to keep his village viable? The loss of his wife, by his own design, only exacerbated his embrace of a facade. Because the guise of the Kazikage had been the only way he'd known how to act for so long, and it couldn't change in a day, on a whim. The trio left, none referring to him as father, but as Kazikage-sama. Perfectly respectful and accurate. That's what he'd been to them and they may depart from the world, thinking he only saw them as weapons and tools, as reflections on Suna's might and potential. The children of a monster, an unfeeling man that would do anything for power. In the quietest parts of his mind he'd admit his jealousy for Minato Namikis. He'd ask, why was he so beloved? Didn't he sacrifice his child? Didn't he do all he could to keep Kanoha strong? Were they really so different? To Rasa's mind, they weren't. And yet, Minato was respected in every nation, every hidden village. Iwa hated him, feared him, but respected him. Rasa was just a wielder of a second-tier Kekei Genkai, and leader of the weakest of the Big Five, only Kiri's civil war changing the designation. So many burdens, so many decisions. But Zuna was recovering, they were gaining their strength and pride back. Just a few more years and everything would be worth it. A few more years. Orochimaru led Naruto to a secret lagoon Tsunade and she would visit when they were younger. She relished the opportunity to indulge in a brief respite, one of her major plans had recently come together. Naruto also needed it. Since he'd been informed of his leadership position and the assassination attempt by that lowly worm, Naruto had been pushing himself harder and harder in his training. His only real breaks were missions, as even if his physical body was resting, he still had clones undertaking some task for him. She could appreciate the diligence, but he'd been nearing a burnout at the exact worst time for one. So, she requested he join her, and forbade any training for the rest of the time before the invasion. The timing worked out perfectly. He'd been working so hard, he didn't remember today was his birthday. His teammates and friends were planning something at the recently finished Yuzumaki Manor, but she'd have him all to herself before then. She hadn't told her student where they would be going, only that he'd need swimwear. As they made the final leg of their trip, she found it adorable how he tried not to stare, her sheer purple kimono with red accents, stopping at the middle of her thigh and showing her curves. Such a gentleman, she'd have to rid him of that once he was older. They came upon the lagoon, and Naruto had to admit it was picturesque clear water shaded by tall trees. It was quiet and peaceful, he understood why Tsunade and Arachimaru Shishu would want to keep it a secret. That, and their other teammate was a self-described super pervert. Speaking of, Naruto tried his best not to perv on Arachimaru, as she rid herself of her kimono to show the black and purple two-piece bikini she was wearing. He prayed his hormones wouldn't betray him in the immediate future. Naruto heard a splash, signaling Arachimaru had entered the water. 
he removed his blue shirt and sandals, leaving only his oar and swim trunks. As he prepared to get into the water, he noticed there was no signs of the burns he endured when fighting Dadara. The Mad Bomber and Sasori of the Red Sands attacked his and Team 7 as they were returning from their mission in the Land of Snow. It was Kakashi's keen senses that allowed them to avoid the initial ambush, but they couldn't escape the fight. Both teams of Kanohan Nin were able to avoid the initial blast thanks to Kakashi. He'd been alerted to two upcoming presences, his senses as sharp as any in Yuzuka's. Both teams tensed but not for the same reasons. Team Kurinai had trained and planned in order to take out any pair of Akatsuki members, all but the leader and his angel Orochimaru, made it clear retreat, and avoidance was the only tactic for them. None of their plans accounted for an additional team, it could make things easier or harder. Kakashi knew who those two were, knew how significant a threat even one could be. Fighting them and protecting his comrades would be near impossible, especially as he was going to tell his team something they weren't going to like. Team, you need to stay back, these two are beyond you. No arguments. He snapped before Sasuke and Kiba could levy their complaints. He understand not wanting to be sidelined, but this wasn't going to be the kind of fight that allowed for mistakes. One wrong move meant death. You ruined my art, un. Didara said from the sky, riding a clay owl. No need for all the talk, let's just grab the fox and go. Sasori said having arrived on the clearing. They'd chosen well, no trees or cover anywhere near. Two long-distance fighters, one with aerial superiority. Kakashi immediately uncovered his Sharingan as Naruto created 20 shadow clones. Ten of the clones, along with the original and Shikamaru, dashed towards Sasori, leaving the rest with Kurinai, Shino and Kakashi. Rasengan one of the clones roared as it pounced on Sasori. It hit the puppeteer's shell but was taken out by its tail at the same time, now the real Sasori was revealed. Naruto thought the man-turned puppet looked smug as he retrieved a stored scroll and unsealed a new puppet. The sand aim Kazikage, just as Orochimaru said he'd go for. She fought with and against Sasori, and said the man had a pattern of escalation. Because of that, there was opportunity for weaker but forewarned combatants to take him out if they planned well and kept sharp. The puppet charged toward Naruto and Shikamaru at great speed, but the Uzumaki met its charge with one of his own, blade drawn. He blocked the poison blade of the Kazikage puppet and performed a replacement with a clone when Sasori unleashed the dozens of hands sealed within the Kazikage's arm. The arms continued toward the real Naruto, but several of the shadow clones were ready. Wine style. Crescent blade barraged the Fuitin jutsu performed by expelling sharp wind blades from the mouth in successive fashion. They tore through the wooden hands and Naruto saw Sasori start to get annoyed as he pulled the Kazikage back. The puppet then shot forward the iron sand the Kazikage was known for. That was the signal, both Naruto and Shikamaru knew. Two shadow clones performed two distinct jutsu, one water style. Torrent Blast, a Zuotin jutsu that forms and compresses water chakra in the stomach before expelling it with enough force to break bone and render one unconscious. The second performed lightning style. Focused bolt to rate and jutsu that concentrates the chakra at the tips of the index finger before emitting a thin concentrated burst of lightning toward a target. The two jutsu combined and hit the oncoming iron sand, momentarily disrupting Sasori's magnetic control. The real Naruto was busy preparing his own jutsu, he could have gone with several alternatives, but this just had the dual purposes of destroying the puppet and distracting Sasori. Lava style. Burning geyser molten rock shot up beneath the Kazikage puppet, the intense heat destroying it. Just for the briefest of moments Sasori displayed a shock. They hadn't known the Jinchuriki had a bloodline, having no reports of him using that type of jutsu. Sasori attempted to retrieve more scrolls, but found he couldn't move. Multiple string light formation multiple clones that had surrounded Sasori said. Their chakra capacity making sure even the S-ranked ninja couldn't simply overpower them. Ninja art. Shadow sewing Jutsu Shikamaru muttered and sent several shadow threads towards Sasori's chakra core, piercing it multiple times. The former Suna ninja was no more. Naruto looked across the clearing. Didara was down, and Shino was approaching him with a chakra suppression tag. Naruto watched as the blonde bomber had a grin, something so wrong given the circumstance. He was already molding chakra when he performed the replacement with Shino, the water style. Gummy wall was drawn up, but not in nearly enough time, the explosion rocked the clearing. Burning Naruto and knocking him out, along with his clones. As he was passed out, Naruto got memories of the fight. 
His clone informed Kakashi of Dadara's weakness for lightning as they watched the Iwa Nin take to the skies. Suddenly, Dadara started hurtling toward the ground. Another clone realized it was Kurunai Sensei. Due to his hatred for Itachi, the blonde had been developing a resistance to optical Jinjutsu, but Kurunai Sensei was a master of the art and focused on the other senses, like the inner ear which affected balance. The clones tossed Kunai in the air, multiplying them with the Kunai Shadow Clone Jutsu and following it up with the lightning style. Chain Lightning Jutsu. Kakashi must have taken his eyes off Dadara for a moment, which is why he missed the swap with the clone. When Naruto returned to consciousness, everything hurt. He could tell he was healing, but the burns were unpleasant, and he felt like he may have broken or fractured ribs. Being clutched tightly by the talons of some clay bird was not helping matters. He was high up, extremely high up. This was not an ideal scenario, and he had to play things just right so he could survive. Naruto ran through what he could do, he could move his hands, but too much movement would alert Dadara. He needed to end this as fast as possible. He could see his team trailing behind him and hoped they were close enough to catch him. Slowly, gently and ignoring the pain, Naruto performed the hand sign for creating a few in Bunshin and had it appear right beside Dadara. The original Naruto immediately summoned a kunai, ran lightning chakra through it and stabbed it into the bird, causing it to falter and release him. The Fuin clone managed to apply the chakra suppression seal, so both ninja were falling helplessly through the sky. Naruto passed out before hit the ground. He was told he Kakashi caught him before he could hit the ground a face full of water brought Naruto out of his thoughts as he sputtered in reaction. The laughter of his sensei filled his ears. He used his shirt to wipe his face before looking at his attacker, questioningly. Kukuku, you were thinking too hard. The point of this is to relax. Or am I not good company, Naruto-kun? No, that's not it, you are. Sorry, just thinking back to when Sasori and Dadara attacked us. H.M. That was well executed. Even if that sacrificial idiocy you're inflicted with flared up. Arachimaru said, waiting in the water. Naruto didn't respond. The fight may have looked easy, Kiba sure seemed to believe so, but given their copious amount of information, the team's abilities and the planning abilities of Inara and Aburam, there were just too many contingencies in place not to overwhelm an enemy that didn't expect you to be much a threat. Naruto finally entered the water, glad it was relatively warm. Arachimaru turned her back as Naruto adopted a mischievous smile. She splashed him, that was a declaration of war. If he didn't retaliate she couldn't really respect him, he reasoned. What he was about to do was because of her, she was sorta asking for it. He immediately became uncomfortable with that line of thought, but persisted to execute his revenge. Naruto cupped his hands together, leaving a narrow space between. Channeling some Zuotin chakra into his hands, he forced a low-powered and tiny stream of chakra through the opening, dousing the back of Arachimaru's head. She swiftly turned to her apprentice and saw him whistling while looking everywhere but at her. She smiled. So, you want to challenge the snake Senin? She spoke with false menace. I'm sorry, what do you mean, Shishu? Naruto hamming up his innocent act but a smile kept appearing on his face, a sign of his guilt. Oh, my apprentice has grown arrogant. Do you think you're the only one to master all five nature types? Of course not, Arachimaru-sama. I just did it before adolescence is all. He said innocently, but a hint of smugness laced his words. He had to swim out of the way of oncoming water wave. And several more after that. Kukuku, is retreating all you can do? I thought you had more fight than that, how disappointing Arachimaru was interrupted as she felt pulled underwater. Once submerged she saw it was a localized whirlpool that drug her under. It dissipated and she was free to move once more. Arachimaru cut through the water at impossible speeds, startling Naruto. She almost got him, attempting to grab him underwater, but Naruto used his chakra to submerge him further and then created more distance from his mentor. Undaunted, Arachimaru continued her chase, Naruto managing to narrowly avoid her several times. However, eventually his luck ran out and he was in the snake Sanin's embrace. Nowhere to run. She whispered in his ear sending a thrill to his core. Can we talk about this? About you attacking your dear teacher from behind? I was framed. We're alone. That's what they want you to think. Oh, really? And who is this they? Arachimaru didn't get a verbal response, instead she felt Naruto grab onto her and go underwater once again. She didn't know what to make of her student's newfound assertiveness until she saw a most displeasing vision. Conan, hovering above them and if she were here, it was more than likely Pain was here as well. 
This wasn't good. She watched as Naruto made dozens of clones, and each began weaving hand signs. Water style. Water lance was the jutsu being performed, and several pressurized jets of water launched into the sky, but Aim's angel avoiding them deftly. That was not unexpected as the clones continued to weave hand signs, those jets became inky black clouds that rained oil on the paper ninjutsu user. Water style. Onyx rain. The manipulation is similar to the nid aim's water style. Bite of the explosive water dragon and that requires a secondary manipulation of a pre-existing suetin jutsu. One Naruto emerges from the water, his hands forming the tiger seal, and then waves of fire spew from his mouth. Fire style. Sea of flames requires the user to store air in his cheeks and expel the chakra from there, so it is possible to inhale and continue the process. As the flow can be slightly uneven it gives the look of waves. Unexpectedly a chubby orange-haired ninja with piercings throughout his face stood in front of the fire jutsu and absorbed it. The well-fed nin was taken off guard when the kusanagi emerged from underwater, even piercing the Naruto in front of him before going through his head. The body collapsed and the clone dispelled into a cloud of smoke. Conan was now on the shore, her paper jutsu ineffective with her covered in oil, at least for the time being. Five more bodies now appear on the water. Naruto Uzumaki, come with me and I may spare the traitor. The one with spiky orange hair said. The response was a numerous amount of tentacles attempting to entrap each of the ninja present. They all took to the air to avoid them, leaving them vulnerable. Several hidden shadow snakes break through the water's barrier and wrap around the multi-phase shinobi, intending to pull him down. Instead the snakes are severed by his bladed tail, and the remaining bodies are grasped by his hands. He gave a powerful pull, and Arachimaru was now on the surface. As the Asura path pulled Arachimaru up, the long-haired human path was closing the distance intent on taking the soul of the snake summoner. It arrived before she could react, hand around her throat, but when the Ninjendo technique was activated, Arachimaru turned into mud. The human path didn't have time to consider its folly, as its feet were encased in ice, and a kunai with an exploding tag appeared in front of it, going off without leaving it any chance of escape. Two bodies were down and while not angered, Pain was not amused. Both Arachimaru and Naruto were running out of air, they'd have to go to the surface soon. They were outnumbered, and Arachimaru was quickly putting together these bodies may have some shared abilities given the Rinnegan each wielded. She had little in the way of information, outside of Pain being able to repel anything that came near him. It wasn't good, but she could turn things around, she had to. The diva path watched as two olive green snakes, of impressive size, came from below. One headed toward the animal path, another toward the Asura path. Almighty pushed the path spoke and the large summons were forced back, hitting several trees before dispelling. Running out of air and options, Arachimaru and Naruto came to the surface, each behind one of the paths, swords drawn. She chose the animal path, Naruto chose the Asura path. The Asura path's tail pierced Naruto before his sword could make contact which resulted in smoke, the animal path deflecting the kusanagi, but not able to avoid the follow-up strike, decapitating it. Every Naruto left underwater came to the surface and began attacking. Most of the remaining clones were dispelled by the Asura path's projectiles and multi-arm attacks. The real Naruto tried to cut the diva path, even managing to cleave into the chakra rod the path generated, but he was too slow to avoid the next one as he took a stab to his right leg before being kicked in his midsection, flying away due to the force. The Azura path was now engaging with Rachimaru directly, her Kusanagi doing well, but not managing to put the path down. Without warning she was stabbed in the back of the near her left shoulder and stabbed in the stomach. She hit the water, barely managing enough chakra to stay on the surface, before she was kicked in the face by the Azura path, hard enough to make her flip to her back. She looked to see the three bodies Naruto and she had managed to defeat had returned. Naruto saw one of the paths collecting the bodies and then throwing them into a thing before they returned fully healed. They were in trouble. He didn't have much time to think, creating a whirlpool, much more powerful than he had earlier, Arachimaru sank to the bottom, taking advantage of the delayed death strike. Naruto summoned dozens of clones again and performed the ninja art. Smokescreen Jutsu. Naruto sent a clone underwater to get Rachimaru, removing the rods from her body, as the real Naruto did the same to his own. The diva path was not bothered by the smokescreen, activating his jutsu once again he blew it away, and from the sounds of it multiple clones, as he heard them poof. When the smokescreen cleared he saw the Jinchuriki and his master, both on their last legs. 
The surroundings were quiet, only the sounds of the birds chirping filled the area. The paths watched as the injured pair returned to their feet and made a desperate charge, but the damage had taken its toll. Both were stabbed multiple times but still alive. The diva path activated his universal pull technique, and Arachimaru helplessly flew toward him. With grim satisfaction, the Asura path plunged a chakra rod into her heart, killing the turncoat. Her final punishment for thinking she could defy God wouldn't be her death, but knowing she failed to protect the motivation for her treachery, the Jinchuriki would die regardless. The disruption from the rod caused a shift in reality and all the path saw it wasn't Arachimaru they killed, but the Naraka path. They all performed the Jinjutsu dispel technique, but fell to try to be cast again. It was confusing, nothing was around to cast it. Nothing but, almighty push. The diva path yelled and expended a good deal of chakra to focus his attack. Soon he heard numerous poofs but the end of the birds chirping. It was an auditory jinjutsu and given the amount of clones, the paths reasoned it likely came from the Uzumaki. They had no information on him wielding any jinjutsu of note, and the lapse in intel had come with a cost. The rest of the paths were fed up, mimicking the real Nagato's emotional state. He saw Conan return, free of the oil and ready to fight once more, but he instructed the paper clone to dispel. He wanted to do this, for their blasphemous actions had arisen his ire. Deep in the forest, sad Rachimaru and Naruto. She'd healed given her special replacement technique, and Naruto was almost back to full capacity due to the QB's chakra. Naruto got confirmation his Jinjutsu had been disabled, and pain would be coming for them soon. The Jinjutsu, what he called Jinjutsu. Chidori was him thumbing his nose at Kakashi, who claimed only a Sharingan wielder could perform his Chidori, when Naruto offered a Jutsu trade. He was thankful Kurenai-sensei had increased the team's Jinjutsu training, including how to layer illusions and how to attack multiple senses. He welcomed the development as it was helping end his blush. Arachimaru had come out of her replacement technique completely naked and hadn't seemed fully aware of it until it was pointed out. The Sanin made a mental note to include some seduction training so he wouldn't fall apart at the sight of a naked woman. Shishu, they ended my Jinjutsu. H.M., were they fold long enough to take one of them out? Yay, the one that healed the others, but it pissed them off so there's that. We need to increase our numbers and buy time, I know you hate it, but use the. Ito Tensei? No, I'm totally fine with it. Naruto created two Yang release. Shadow clones with control seals implanted in them and retrieved the DNA samples he had. He performed the jutsu just as Arachimaru was doing the same. Two caskets emerged, while Naruto's clones just transformed into his two revived nin. When the techniques were done, Dadara and Kisum stood beside the Shadai and the Nidame Hokage. Naruto gave Dadara some of the special clay the missing ninja died with, and gazed Kisum Samahata and the two took off, one in the air and one on the ground. The first two Hokage simply looked at Orochimaru and he in bemusement. You should have never created that jutsu, brother. I shouldn't have done a lot of things, but it's too late to change that. You, Yuzumaki, why am I here? Tabarama said, having sensed the boy's lineage through his chakra. He was clearly an Yuzumaki, and also a Jinchuriki. Okay, quick rundown. There is this organization hunting down Jinchuriki like myself. Side note, we're all pretty much treated like total shit so thanks for that, Hashirama-sama. Anyway, the leader attacked my Shishu, and I and is extremely powerful. He holds the Rinnegan, the eyes of the Sage of Six Paths, but appears to have separated his abilities into six different bodies. Each body has an ability, one can create advanced weaponry, another has control over attractive and repellent forces. One can absorb chakra and renders ninjutsu useless. We don't know about the other two. Arachimaru added and then gave the physical descriptions for the ones they had information on. Let's go brother. Tabarama said, which surprised Hashirama. And why would I do that? Open your senses, clearly the boy is Mito's successor, and we are near Kanoha. Who is to say this man won't target the village? Besides, the strapling is injured and can't fight as he is. Although he knew how serious this was, his life was on the line, Naruto wanted to justify his injury to his idol, but realized this wasn't the time. Fine, brother. As soon as he answered the forest shook with the sounds of high-yield explosives. That caused the Senju brothers to depart immediately. Both Arachimaru and Naruto stayed where they were, their choosing to take the break the Ito Tensei allowed them. The snake Sanin's mind fast at work for a counter-strategy, and every moment she could have to plan the better. 
while Naruto was villing the returned Hokage on the situation, Didara had come across the animal path, who was on top a bird summons. The explosion release users wasted no time attempting to pepper the path with his explosive creations, but the bird was agile in the air and avoided direct damage. The two flew above the trees and frustrated sat in for the one's dead shinobi, so much so he forewent any offense, only focusing on speed to close the distance. Once he did he leapt off the clay bird and using his body exploded in the air. It took out the bird, but the animal path jumped off its summon right before impact and landed on a multi-headed dog. When Dadara reformed, he continued to lay explosive after explosive, but it only increased the dog's power as it grew more and more heads. The animal path summoned another animal, a rhino to accompany the dog as they tried to keep Dadara occupied, at least until the human path could arrive, as it was rapidly approaching. The animals were dealing damage, while the dog absorbed all of Dadara's offense, much to his annoyance. The bomb enthusiast started to flood the area with his Z4 explosives and watched as not even the dog summons could handle it. The animal path too had succumbed but the area of effect was limited and the human path had not been infected and managed to remove the Ito soul before it could explode again. However, the path did not avoid the wood spike that pierced its head. The diva path looked as the Asura path lay headless. The Samahata interrupted the chakra receivers long enough for Kissim to cleave its head off. Until that point, the former Kiri swordsman's attacks had been rendered ineffective, the pre-top path absorbing all he could muster, while Diva and Asura retaliated. He immediately pushed the sword away from the undead ninja. Kissim started weaving hand signs again for another Suetin Jutsu, his water shark bomb, and just like times previous it was absorbed, but pre ta was kicked back by the Shadai Hokage. Almighty pushed the Diva path said, avoiding the attack of the second Hokage as he sent the man out of the lagoon. Kizum followed suit, now pressing the attack, having abandoned his ninjutsu. It was clear the man wasn't as good in unarmed combat as the diva path managed to stab him several times with the chakra rod. The nidame returned, and the pair were attacking in tandem, starting to overwhelm the path. The diva path performed his jutsu again, repelling the suetin masters as, through their shared vision, he saw the pre-top path get its face caved in by the shadai. Five seconds. The Nidame said, but the Diva Path didn't react. All three Ito Tensei started peppering the Lone Path with various water jutsu, managing to dodge most of them until he was cornered and had to perform the Almighty Push again. As soon as he did, the three ninja were on him. He was getting attacked from multiple sides, blocking two strikes left him open for a third. The attacks were relentless, and the path was growing increasingly frustrated. A hard left straight from Kissim sent him flying back, but he welcomed the space. Skidding out of the lagoon, onto dry land a diva path performed his most powerful technique. Chibaku Tensei. The surrounding area became overturned as the extreme pull of the gravity technique took hold. Each ninja tried to fight the attractive force, but couldn't and soon each were entombed into a small satellite. The chakra use was straining enough that Nagato faltered, causing a short disconnection from his path. He recovered and made his way toward Orochimaru and Naruto at least where he'd assumed they'd be. Orochimaru and Naruto saw the moon-like object being created and how their remaining Ito Tensei were encased within. They didn't know how many more paths were left, but they did know they would be on their way. Neither were in perfect shape, Orochimaru had expelled a good bit of chakra with the summoning and restoring herself. Naruto's leg healed, mostly, but he still didn't have his full mobility. They were low on time and needed a strategy. You should leave. The Uzumaki said. He wants me alive so I may be able to buy some time for reinforcements to arrive. If they haven't arrived already it means something is happening within the village. Still doesn't change, he only wants to kill one of us. Immediately, he only wants to kill one of us immediately. I have faith you'd come rescue me. Flattery at a time like this? Kukuku, I may blush. I take that to mean you aren't leaving? Naruto asked. No, I'm not leaving so get ready. Naruto wasted no more time trying to convince her to leave, instead he began centering himself. He didn't have a foolproof way to utilize the QB's chakra, but he'd found success in not thinking about it as a matter of control, but an experience to endure. Similar to a surfer's relationship to the wave. The metaphor became something of a mantra, and as Naruto delved deep into the chakra core, he reminded himself to embrace the wave, to be one with it. He repeated it over and over as he drew more and more of the QB's chakra out, going out of the zero-tailed state to form an initial cloak. 
one tail became two, embrace the wave, embrace the wave he thought as two became three, and he stopped pulling. Must you repeat that insipid phrase every time you abuse my power? Germain? You know good damn well my name is not Germain. I'm kinda busy here, and if you just tell me your name I wouldn't have to guess, Jiro. The QB scoffed and said nothing more, ending the conversation just in time for the diva path to arrive, alone. He pulled both Kanoha Ninja toward him, grabbing each by the neck and slamming them down. Naruto swatted the hand away with a tail, Arachimaru turned into mud, while the real Kanoichi darted toward pain from his flank, Kusanagi gleaming in the sunlight. He let go of Naruto and created a chakra rod to meet the legendary sword. The rod was cleaved in two, but it halted its momentum enough to spin away from the next swipe. He grabbed Naruto's wrist, narrowly avoiding a Rasengan and tossing the boy away. He repelled Rachimaru when she attempted to attack his blind side, and she slammed into a tree. The Jinchuriki was back, taking furious wipes, but Pain defended the attack, kicking Naruto in the stomach in response, and then hitting him in the jaw. He didn't expect the Jinchuriki to absorb the blow, nor to grab his arm, and proceeding to kick the Rinnegan wielder in the ribs. Pain was taken off his beat due to the force, which was amplified by a pair of great breakthrough jutsu performed by teacher and student. Pain landed, feet first on a tree and kicked off. Orochimaru performed the hidden shadow snake hands jutsu planning to stall his charge, but Pain avoided them and continued forward. There was a clang of sword against chakra rod. Pain attempting several thrusts while Orochimaru would deflect them or dodge. Pain overcommitted on one such attack, and the snake sent and rotated away from the attacking arm, swirling the kusanagi behind her back before bringing it up aiming to slash at his face. He quicking repelled her again, but sent a chakra rod toward in as well. Naruto swatted the rod and re-engaged. His body was able to handle this much of the QB's chakra for long, and he felt his body starting to give under the strain, which made keeping calm and centered exponentially more difficult. He charged, ignoring the pain, trying his best to land a significant strike on pain. But he was outmatched, and pain began to batter him, punching combinations connecting to Naruto's face, before he was knocked away again, and found his stomach pierced with a chakra rod, ending his biju cloak. He then repeated the tactic Naruto interfered with as Arachimaru charged at him again. Without her student to block the rod, she too found herself impaled by pain's weapon. The path didn't show it, but he was inwardly relieved. He could feel the Ito Tensei trying to break free, and he had been pushed harder than he expected. He walked over to the Uzumaki, in a different lifetime someone he may have looked at as family, but now a means to an end. The boy, battered and bleeding, his left eye swollen shut and barely hanging on to consciousness. He picked him up by his neck, making sure not to do any more damage. This may mean very little to you, but your sacrifice will bring about a lasting peace. He said as he darted off with the boy, the snake sent and helpless to stop him. It's unfortunate, had the QB been sealed into some else, I could have used someone of your talents. I get why she betrayed us for you. He saw the boy's lone functioning eye widen. You didn't know? Had I agreed to find a way to keep you alive after the extraction she wouldn't have left. But I'm a god and I don't make deals. Why you're no more a god than I am a giant? Naruto struggled to say. You don't need to believe me. Your opinion doesn't matter. Naruto really detested this mud prick and wanted nothing more than to shut him up permanently. However, the rod in his gut made molding chakra near impossible. Suddenly, Naruto felt the grip around his neck tighten as pain began moving faster, but after a minute, the path simply collapsed, as if its strings had been cut. Naruto lost the battle for his consciousness as he laid on the forest floor. Guys, I will stop here, I hope did you enjoyed. This video. If you do please leave a like and subscribe for more amazing content and if you are still watching this video then comment snakes. Thanks you guys for watching this video. Take care. See you in next video. 10.